gorgeous morning. Good morning, Zion Church. It's good to see each and every one of you on this special graduation Sunday. Let's stand and greet each other before we get started. God bless you as we worship together. Good morning. And as Don uh, Raver would say, good morning, Lord. And I'm glad that he's with us today. Our announcements today is uh, Zion Church is involved in the Baby Bottle Boomerang Fundraiser for Serenity Pregnancy Research Center. There are baby bottles in the chapter, and uh, would you please take one to help out? Please uh, see the insert in today's bulletin for more. Uh, March for Jesus is inviting the Warland Body of Christ to unite in a time of prayer while walking downtown on Saturday, May 22nd. There is more information in the insert bulletin. Uh, consistory will meet uh, Thursday, May 20th at 7 p.m. with the uh, Finance Committee at 6.30. I think Kelly will be here. Good morning. Happy graduation, seniors. Woo, you did it. <laughs> um, I'm just up here this morning to remind you that BBS is coming up uh, June 28th through July 1st, four days this year. And there's a handy dandy little checklist in your bulletin today, and we would love to have you volunteer. And not only volunteers, we need your kids. So if you go to the Zion website, there is a link there that you can sign your kids up, um, grandkids, friends, whatever. And I just wanted to, to see a show of hands of these seniors. How many of you have either attended BBS or volunteered for BBS over the years? There's a handful of you. So, just so you know the impact that this can have, this, this outreach community or outreach can have on the kids in our community, it's huge. So we'd love to have you volunteer. Thank you. And uh, Father's Day um, on June 20th, we'd like to bless our dads with a bag of homemade cookies. There's a sign up sheet in the foyer, and if you can help, uh, uh, the bag of cookies would be appreciated on Saturday the 19th at 10 30. Uh, is there any other announcements? Yes, um, we just want to give a congratulations on two metrics. The first is that the soccer team is undefeated and is going to the playoffs. So, for the very few who don't know that, congratulations. <laughs> And also that our own Rudy Sanford has made the all-star basketball team. That's pretty impressive. So good job, Rudy. Thank you. Because of graduation, we will be holding off on the class, every young man's battle, every young woman's battle until next week. Uh, we do have some new helpers that are coming in, and, uh, in place of 
my wife, who's going to be leaving. Uh, she is going to be so mad at me for this, but she has accepted a job at Cook's Children's Hospital. Uh, and uh, sorry to say, but this is going to be her last Sunday here with us. So if you want to see her, she'll be at the back door t today. And uh, you can uh, tell her goodbye. And, uh, and uh, we'll, I'll still be around, but uh, she has to go because she has to go to work on Monday. So, uh, but it's a very good paying job, very great benefits, and she just couldn't pass it up. So, uh, if you'll uh, give her a warm welcome, goodbye, we'd appreciate it. God bless you. to celebrate our eight seniors. So we will begin uh, with words from our high school principal, Mr. Sanford. Thanks, Julia. So initially I was pretty flattered to do this and then it dawned on me a few days ago that uh, my older brother is gonna be in the audience today listening. So I'm incredibly terrified because he always has very uh, creative and pointed feedback for me. So. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, Kelly, be, be kind, please. So I'm very humbled and honored to speak to you about these young people. As an entire class, the class of 2021 has been exceptional. Each one of these individuals possesses special talents and abilities that are unique. They are swimmers, singers, basketball players, football players, soccer players, employees, cheerleaders, and absolutely every one of them is an outstanding academic student. Regrettably, it's been a few years since I was a teenager approaching my 20s, so I'm not exactly sure what advice or words of wisdom I have to offer them that are applicable at this current time. But with that said, this is my humble advice and message to the graduates of the class of 2021. As I progress through my life, I find the most valuable part to me are the relationships that I have with others. My relationship with my wife, my parents, my brother, and my family. In a recent book that I read regarding how to teach and coach Generation Z, the overview of the book captured my interest. It was a story about a college football coach on a recruiting trip asking the headmaster of an all-boys school what he could share with him as far as advice from his lengthy career. And the headmaster replied, we have to honor the relationship before we can honor the task. The book considered how different the world is for young people than it was for me at that age and how could my generation better connect with them and become a more positive influence in their lives. The book discusses and compares two different types of relationships, and it, it appeared to me that this transcended just teaching and coaching. The two types of relationships are consumer relationships versus covenant relationships, an idea that originated with pastor and author Timothy Keller. We live in a consumer-driven society where we are constantly trying to find the newest upgrade or the best deal possible. Many of our decisions then become based on what is best for us individually and what makes us feel good at any given point in time. A consumer relationship is one-sided. It works out of the mindset that the other person in the relationship must adjust to me and meet my needs or I'm going to leave the relationship for someone who can. We say I will be who I'm supposed to be as long as you are who you are, you're supposed to be. The only goal in the end is my own fulfillment no matter, no matter how we go about it. A consumer relationship is not committed and is certainly not based in service to others. It lacks honesty and it lacks trust. It is transactional in nature and there is no way any relationship with another person can be transactional in nature and still be considered healthy and meaningful. A consumer relationship is a version of conditional love and who has ever sought out and grown from conditional love. The definition of a covenant as it relates to religion is an agreement that brings about a commitment between God and his people. A covenant relationship is not selfish in nature. It is other-centered. It is the acknowledgement that my partner in the relationship is more important than me. It focuses on what we have to give to the other person and not what we can gain from them. It is a voluntary, mutual, binding promise to be loving, dedicated, faithful, with no consideration to what the circumstances are. In this relationship, both parties have value and both parties are viewed as equal. In a covenant relationship, both people are saying that the relationship itself is more important than any individual's desires. 
Both parties are committing to the other person and the other person's needs, even if mine are not being met. Religion has taught us the meaning of a covenant relationship through God's vow to love and care for us, no matter what we do. Religious love is universal and salvation is open to all, despite our continued failure. A covenant relationship is a sign of love, it is the embodiment of love. You are voluntarily giving of your time, of your freedom. You are investing in others with no concern for their investment back. Covenant relationships are unconditional love, and they are the most joyful and life-changing that we can experience in our lives. Finally, I would encourage each graduate to forge their own path. Build covenant relationships that not only look to the future, but look within and look to one another and ultimately look upward. Do not compare yourself to others as they are not you and you are not them. I heard a quote from a colleague recently, and I, the colleague wasn't sure who said it, and I'm not sure who the original quote came from, but it certainly resonated with me. Comparison is the thief of joy. Each situation in life is different. Compare yourself to your values, virtues, and code of ethics rather than to others' accomplishments. So in closing, job well done to the class of 2021. By the way, especially to Rudy and Dawson, go Centipedes, Southside, <laughs> way to go. You have a long list of accomplishments to date, but there's more out there for you to achieve and conquer. Congratulations, and I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. He always has to give a dig, doesn't he? <laughs> Graduates, can you please join me up on stage? I'm going to have you take a microphone and pass it down um, and tell us your future plans after I introduce you. Haley Carver. Haley maintained a 4.0 throughout high school. She was a member of All-State Choir and All-State Jazz Choir. Haley was a member of Marshaz. Haley, can you tell us your future plans, please? Um, I'm planning to go to Sheridan for my generals before transferring for speech pathology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Zachary Cole. Zach began swimming in seventh grade with USA Swim and middle school and high school swim teams. He has qualified in several events for state swim since his freshman year. Zach enjoys photography and won a high school photography contest in February through Northwest College. He is also being inducted into the National Honor Society. Zach, can you tell us your future plans? Uh, I'm planning to go to Northwest and transferring to some school to major in business and hopefully become a pastor afterwards. Lily Lundgren. Lily has received a 4.0 GPA all throughout her schooling while being involved in color guard, cheer, managing wrestling, W club, and National Honor Society. Lily, can you tell us your future plans? I plan to go to the University of Wyoming uh, major undecided. Thank you. Annalise Newell. Annalise enjoyed swimming in high school and competed at state her junior and senior year. Annalise sang in the concert choir, Troublesome, and Marchaz. She also played the clarinet in marching band and symphonic band. She is a member of the W Club, class secretary and student council, and enjoyed being a mentor to a student through the Big Brother Big Sister program. Annalise is the secretary of the National Honor Society. She is gradu graduating valedictorian. Annalise, please tell us your future plans. I'm going to be majoring in mechanical engineering at University of Wyoming. Dawson Rogers. Dawson has worked the last two years at Baumgars and he has been able to keep up his school and social life. Dawson, please tell us your future plans. My future plans are undecided. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Rudy Sanford. Rudy would like to thank his church family for their support. Rudy's accomplishments in high school are Principal's Honor Roll, W Club, National Honor Society, State FFA AgriScience winner, 
earned state FFA degree, four-year letterman in football, basketball, and soccer, Mower Award winner, 2018-19 state soccer championship, and hopefully won this year, and 2020-21 state basketball championship. Rudy, can you tell us your future plans? Um, I'll be attending the University of Wyoming to major in business. Gabe Sherman. Gabe was active in football, basketball, soccer, FFA, and 4-H until his freshman year in high school. His in interest then, then turned to taking on a bigger role in the family farm, excelling in school, and being very active in the Warrior Welding Program, which included the National Wide Skills USA competition. Throughout his childhood and teenage years, Gabe has developed a great love for the farming profession. Gabe, can you tell us your future plans? I uh, plan on going down to Casper College and earning Business degree next year. Thank you. And Ray Lynn Wilson. Ray Lynn has participated in cheer, flags, choir, and the W Club. She was also a member of the National Honor Society. Ray Lynn, can you tell us your future plans? I plan to attend the University of Wyoming to study elementary education. Congratulations, graduates, and best of luck in your new adventures. Pastor will now come up to give you your gifts. While Matt's passing those out, I'd just like to remind you guys of a couple of verses of Scripture. One comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, or verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. You're the example setters. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 6 says this, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. It's been a pleasure to be your pastor down through these years. Uh, I've been some of you's youth pastor and uh, senior pastor, and that's been a privilege to watch you grow up into great young men and great young ladies, and uh, we look forward to see what's going to happen in the future. Jack, Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day of worship that we can sing praise to your name. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, that took our sins away. We pray for those that can't be with us today, and we especially pray for our graduates. We pray that they will continue their walk with you and their faith will be strengthened. We pray that our ears could hear the message from Matt today and bless him as he delivers this message. In Christ's name, amen. Our call to worship today is from Psalms 112, verses 1 to 3. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord and who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land, and the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endures forever.
Please stand with us as we sing our opening hymn. sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and prostrate and sit and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. In Romans, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. What was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed to the knee to bow. Church, uh, what is it that we believe? I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified by death and buried, he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one and holy universal Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the earth. Devoted, like a ring of solid gold, like a 
Praise of angels will never end. 
morning I'd just like to share with you graduates some of the things that are in your gift packages. One of them is a life journal. If you don't use anything else in that gift package, please open that up and learn how to read scripture and then hear what God was saying to the people that he wrote it to and then write down what he is saying to you today. It may not mean anything to you right now. It may not mean anything to you a week from now. But a year from now, it may mean everything to you. Take the opportunity to use these. They're very important. Also, we got you the uh, uh, God's Promises for Graduates. Uh, I think you will enjoy that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of promises in the Word of God, and He has promises for you graduates. Uh, he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Isn't that a wonderful congregation? Yes. Before we go to prayer, I just want to remind you, if you haven't heard, Nancy Kaiser fell this week and broke her leg and had to have surgery on Wednesday, and uh, it was uh, quite extensive. Uh, she had, uh, there were three actual breaks in her leg. And uh, she's going to be going through an extensive period of rehab. So keep her and Larry in your prayers. Uh, Larry's taking a couple of weeks off to, just to take care of her. Uh, because uh, she right now is non-load bearing. She can't even uh, get up to get her own pills. So uh, be keep them in your prayers. I know they would appreciate it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today is such an incredible day, but before we get started uh, with the incredible things of the day, Lord, we want to lift up Nancy to you and ask that you would be with her and help her to heal quickly. Lord, that uh, type of surgery where they put a rod all the way through the leg bone can be extremely painful, but Lord, we ask that you would be with her, give her the peace that passes all human understanding. And, Lord, bring her the health and the healing that it can only come from your hand. You are our great physician. The doctors did a great job in mending that leg, but, Lord, we know that you are her great physician. And be with Larry as he takes care of her. Give him the patience and uh, what he needs to help her to get through this time. Father, we thank you for this special day where we recognize our graduates. We ask, Lord, that today you seal in their hearts the fact that you are their Lord and that you love them no matter what they go through, no matter where they're at in life. You have an unconditional love just for them. Lord, I pray that they would remember everything that their parents have taught them uh, about Scripture and about you, Lord, and everything that they've learned inside the church. Uh, the ones that have been through confirmation and even those that haven't, that they would recall those things and remember why it is important in these days especially to stand up and serve the Lord. Uh, Lord, in Ephesians 6, you told us, having done all to stand, stand therefore. So help these young people to make a stand. We're looking so forward to seeing what each one of them becomes because we know that you have a purpose and you have a plan specifically for each one of them. And you've had that plan even when they were in their mother's womb. So... As that plan and that purpose comes to fruition, we just ask that you would give them your favor, your blessing, and most of all, your love. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we certainly do like to sing Days of Elijah, do we not? So many people, we just enjoy it when that song comes on. By the way, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it because while I've spent some time with Paul Wilbur, that doesn't mean I can sing like him. So 
Don't fret. And you know what? It is exciting to sing because Elijah, he was a prophet of some great and mighty miracles. But you know what? The days of Elijah in general were dark and full of sin. But in the midst of that darkness, Elijah was used to make it known that the Lord, Yahweh, I am that I am, that he was God, that he alone was the true God. And we too can have a spirit of boldness on behalf of the Lord. We too can make him known. And we too can have a spirit of Elijah. Now, as you may imagine, today's message was crafted with our graduates in mind. And I think you'll see how that applies. It, it won't take up much explanation. But you know what? It also applies to all of us, to each one of us, each of our lives, wherever they may take us. Well, you know, at Liberty Seminary, I took this course my first year, and we were told you should really pattern your ministry after someone in the Bible that you find that you're like, that you're like this person. That'll help you in your ministry. Doesn't mean you have to do it in every respect, but find someone that's like you as, as someone, a model for you. Look to their best attributes. And, you know, I didn't have one at the time. I thought, you know, I, I really like cats. I'm kind of a cat person, so maybe Daniel. But that was really the only real application. But over time, I really found a kindred spirit in Elijah because he has no problem just arguing with people. <laughs> you know, he's, he's very uh, confrontational to the world and the world of sin and false gods. He has no problem. In other words, he uses the gift of being a contrarian in, in a good way. Now, you know, being a contrarian can certainly be a gift if you use it in the right way. You don't want to just argue over anything, but he certainly did this. Now, this is despite the fact. So when you look to an example, and I encourage everyone here to do this, someone in the Bible that you can model yourself after, it doesn't mean in every respect. It, it's in that one prophetic boldness that Elijah had that I find a kindredness. You know, Elijah's described, though, as a very hairy man. So that should underscore that it's not in every respect that you need to be like these people. Now, just a little bit of background. During the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, the nation of Israel had almost completely been given over to Baal worship. Now, this was the world that the prophet found him in his nation that was supposed to be called out to make the Lord known. Almost the entire nation now was worshiping a false god. So in 1 Kings 18, Ahab and Elijah, so this wicked king and God's prophet, they have a showdown on top of Mount Carmel. Now Mount Carmel, beautiful, beautiful mountain in Israel. Um, John, Janet, put that on your list. And you know, you can see, you can see the Jezreel Valley next to it. It's where Armaged the Valley of Armageddon is. And on a really, really clear day, you can see Nazareth way in the distance. And it's got some nice trees on it, very nice. And it's this setting where it's sort of sticking out, and there's not a lot of mounds beside it like we have over here. So it's quite distinct, and you can tell where it is. And it's this setting where the showdown happens. So Ahab had the people of Israel gather together on Carmel, and there were 450 prophets of Baal that came down there for the showdown versus this one prophet of the Lord, the one prophet of Yahweh, Elijah. And in fact, his name means Yahweh is my God. So here's the challenge that Elijah was able to make. He said, we're both going to build altars and have a bunch of wood on both. And then we will put our sacrifice on there, a lamb, and we will ask each of our respective gods to bring fire down upon the sacrifice and consume it. And whoever has fire come down, that'll prove that that's the real God. And in fact, um, the prophets of Baal said, okay, that seems like a good idea to us. To which I, I just think to myself, my goodness, you are really confident in Baal. I, that's not something I don't know if I'd agree with, but 
All right, so here's what happens. The prophets of Baal get to go first. And they cry out for him to bring fire down. They're like, oh, please, Baal, bring fire down. I don't know if that's exactly what they said, but I imagine. We just know that they're yelling out to bring fire down. Please, please. And, you know, there's no surprise. There's no answer. They keep crying, but there's no answer. Nothing happens. So Elijah responds with mockery. He decides to mock them in the midst of this. And this is what he says in verse 27. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied, you know, in the, in the Hebrew, it's, it's implying he's going to the bathroom. But either he is occupied, maybe he's in the bathroom, or he's gone aside, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So often our Lord is mocked by the world. I have to tell you, it's nice to read about a prophet just giving it back to the world a little bit. You know, John Calvin famously remarked, he says this, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. There's a power to have that spirit to just be bold for the world and not just always be on defense, but say these are false, evil belief systems. And there's nothing wrong with calling those out. There's good, it is good to be bold speak plainly on behalf of our master, Jesus. Now, in the next verse, it's noted that the prophets of Baal started to cut themselves. And it says, quote, unquote, according to their custom. And this would somehow make Baal want to respond if they cut themselves. Now, demonic influence often leads to intentional cutting in scripture, that where you would just cut yourselves because you had some kind of demonic influence over you. Uh, if you remember from uh, Mark, 5, 1 through 13, there was a man, it says he was cutting himself with rocks, and then we read in the scripture that because he had a demonic influence. So there's some, when we see Baal worship, there's a darkness behind this worship that is not just the worship of a false god, but of this evil satanic system that was influencing them. But despite the fact that they're cutting themselves, no fire comes down. They continue to cry out. But to quote verse 29, there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. So Elijah told all the people, he said, come near to me, come, come in. And then Elijah built an altar to the Lord that had been torn down. He used 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he placed wood on the altar, and then he dug out a trench around it that the Baal worshipers didn't do. And then he had water poured over the altar three times. So there's, there's some uh, symb symbolism here of a revelation because three is usually associated with this. But notice that there was so much water that was poured over the altar that it even filled in the trench. I mean, it's just muddy and it's just a mess. It's about as wet as they could get it. Then we read, um, again, as Zach had read so well this morning in 1 Kings 18, 36-39. Then this happens. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah was bold in proclaiming the name of the one true God. The Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He sought to make it publicly known that his life could be used, that he on that day could be used to make it known who the true God was, that the Lord, the God of Abraham, was the true God. And by him being used, it can make that evident. Elijah certainly made him known, for sometimes the Lord answers with fire. You know, fire can burn in you, 
through a close relationship with your Savior, Jesus, and the filling of the Holy Spirit? Now, there might be a couple of you nitpicking, going, ah, oh, the pastor is using fire in a different sense. Well, it's, it's the fire, regardless, it's the glory and fire and power of the Lord that came down from heaven, but that can burn in you with the Holy Spirit. It's connected to that same source of power. And you can be set on fire to let others know about the Lord and the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. You can just be so blazing in your behavior and actions and boldness and love for others that it can be evident that who you are being used for, who your life is being used for. And this is why I said, sometimes being a contrarian can be good. Not always. I must admit, I enjoy um, nice debate and argumentation perhaps too much. But being a contrarian is good when you're surrounded by sin, wickedness, and paganism. That's the time to not be timid and to seek to be like the world, but to be distinct and make it know what the truth is. And yes, Baal, he's a name for a Canaanite deity. But scripture often refers to the Baals in plural. And that's because Baal was at times used to describe any number of generic false gods in the Canaanite region. Well, we have our own Baal set against the one true God. And so may I suggest that there are bales in places that we may not suspect. There may be bales at our work, certainly on TV, on the news, especially CNN. And <laughs> you can sense that. And you know, I hate to say this, and perhaps, perhaps more than ever, um, on campus, I've spent a lot of time on college campuses, all of you, a lot of time. And it's not just because I'm slow. <laughs> Just couldn't leave for a while. And yes, there's certainly different types of bales, meaning there's worship of worldly things that can, you can just get wrapped up in and distract you from a knowledge and truth of God. So it's just good to guard yourself about that because not everything is obvious. Hey, we're going to worship Satan tonight. You know, it can take, this can take different mass. Sometimes it's like that. Now, later in the next chapter, at 1 Kings 19, Jezebel, she vows to have Elijah killed. And then, you know what, he finds out about this and he falls into depression. And as our uh, brother, you know, while you were saying this morning, that's uh, 48 hours later, less than that, he is used to see this great miracle, and now he's fallen into depression. And he's just going, oh, Lord, just let me die. You know, um, even though we know God and have seen his power, it is a human nature to sometimes fall into depression. So you shouldn't think, well, therefore, I'm not, I don't really know the Lord. Sometimes that flesh can take over, but that doesn't mean you don't know him. But just keep crying out to him, as Elijah does. After this powerful miracle, he could still get depressed. So just don't think the depression, you're, everyone faces depression, some more to others, but it's, it doesn't mean you don't know God and it doesn't mean everything is over. Just push through, seek his face, cry out to him, try to foster your relationship with him and he'll get you through it and he'll keep using you. Now, even later in 1 Kings 19, Elijah traveled to Mount Horeb, Sinai, it's the same mountain, it has two names for some reason, there's a lot of debate. And it was there where he lamented to the Lord. He's crying out to him. And he says to the Lord, I'm the only prophet of God left. I'm the only one in all of Israel that even loves God. He felt alone. He felt isolated. But the Lord assured Elijah that there were 7,000 others in Israel that had not bent the knee to Baal and had not kissed him. 7,000 others had not submitted now, Paul looked to 1 Kings 19 to make an important point towards the opening of Romans 11. And he said this in Romans 11, 2 through 4, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And I alone am left. And they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him, Paul writes? And God says, 
I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now in Paul's day, Israel at large, the nation at large, had rejected Jesus as the Messiah, had rejected him as their king. But Paul reminds us that there is always a remnant. And that day there was a remnant of Jews that go, no, we do recognize the true God. We recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. And there's always a remnant of God's people throughout history. And that is true here as well. Whether believing Jews in Paul's day or true followers of Jesus in our day. So you may feel at times, especially if you're a believer and you're on a campus setting, and there's a lot of, um, a lot of professors who make it their job. They might be teaching finance, and you'll go in and they'll have whole lectures on how the Bible's made up. And it has nothing to do with anything. There, believe me, there's an ax to grind on campus. Um, I wish I wasn't exaggerating. I, I'm not. So there's a spirit there. So sometimes you can feel like, I just want to conform, and you could feel alone, but you're not alone. 7,000 people truly on fire for God is more than you'll ever need. Now, John Wesley said this. This is one of my favorite quotes from him. John Wesley wrote, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell. So where you end up may come off as dark and full of sin, the setting you find yourself for any of us. And many, if not most people, will mock you for your Christian beliefs. They may worship the things of this fallen world, whether directly or tacitly. You may feel alone on campus, in the military, in your new job, etc., wherever you may find yourself. But remember, there is a remnant of God's people close by. Remind yourself that there are 7,000 other saints near to you, if not 100,000, if not millions across the world right now, and if not billions in this world and in the one to come. Great saints with the Lord's now, who you're part of their great body. You're part of a congregation that you can't even see right now. Now, so often, we hear messages about the spirit of Jezebel. This is a very popular sermon topic I've seen in the last few years. Always referencing a spirit of Jezebel rising up in the world. In fact, um, there's a very popular book written just a few years ago, two or three years ago-ish, that even said one of our uh, most um, prominent female politicians was the new Jezebel. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is, and it's sold very well, so this, this comes up. And, um, hey, I, I'm not saying, I didn't write that book. It is amusing, though. Uh, <laughs> so, but we often hear this. There's a spirit of Jezebel rising up. And those preachers are right to say this. I am certainly not criticizing them. But every time I hear that, I hear about the spirit of Jezebel, that there's a spirit of worldliness and a spirit of hating the Lord rising up. I think to myself, and I want you to hear me on this. Whenever Baal, whenever Satan rises up a spirit of Jezebel in the world, you know what? The Lord will raise up a spirit of Elijah to counter that spirit. So brothers and sisters, may the spirit of Elijah rise up in each one of you right now. May the Lord answer your cries for him, and may he answer that with fire in your life. May you be set on fire to make him known to your friends and neighbors. And when this sinful world mocks your Lord and Savior, bark back at them. Please join me in prayer. Lord Father, thank you so much for creating us, for your blessed Son who died on the cross for us, and through having faith in him, we may have eternal life for his righteousness through his blood is imputed upon us. Lord, we ask that we may be used boldly to make you known wherever we find ourselves and our lives. Let it be known through our actions, deeds, and words, and attitude that you alone, Lord Father, are God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that you are God. And let that be known through our lives so that ultimately other people can come to know you, come to know you through your son, Jesus Christ, and his gospel, and have a loving relationship and salvation with you, Lord Father. 
And these things we praise and ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Amen. Please stand with us. Graduates go first because they've got a lot to do this afternoon. 